young people aren't quite in yet, but we're trusting them to gather in. And it's so good to have some visitors here with us. And I think we, I don't know, as pastors, sometimes we, we just kind of see how many people were gone. And I think we had about 50 gone this morning. And, uh, but we're glad that some people um, slip away from other services because that allows us to have visitors. And so, so it, yeah, what goes around comes around. And we're very, very grateful for each of you being here tonight. Why don't we just say, Lord, you have access to my heart and mind in this service. Perhaps it's been a long day for you. Um, maybe there's been a lot of things that have demanded your attention. Uh, maybe not. But whatever, whatever the dynamics of your, your life have been today, let's just ask the Lord to come in his own gentle way and do his work in our hearts. I believe he has something special for us in this service if we'll just allow him to do and allow him access to our hearts. Let's stand together. Let's invite the presence of the Lord. Ask that he would come and be with us in a special way tonight. Father, it's a joy to gather into your presence once again. We thank you for the wonderful privilege of worshiping with your people. Thank you for the opportunity of gathering into this sanctuary and focusing our attention on you. We thank you today for your help this morning. Thank you for the wonderful service you gave to us. Your presence that was here in such a special way. And the wonderful truth that was proclaimed. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done. But this is another service tonight. And Lord, we know that you don't waste any services. And so, Lord, we give you access to this service. We commit this service to you. We commit ourselves to you, our heart and our mind. We give it all to you and allow you to do your work in our hearts. Accept our worship tonight. And we'll certainly give you praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's join in the singing as Brother Tim comes to lead us. Good evening. I hope you've all had a great day and uh, enjoyed the service this morning. Thankful for God's presence. And after Andy made that uh, statement, my mind's been thinking about where did that phrase come from, your beauty rest? <laughs> I've never seen it work. So I just want to know where it came from. I'll be looking that up later, or somebody can look it up and let me know later. But uh, where did that come from? Now, attitude adjustment from sleeping, that might work. But beauty, nah, it doesn't happen. 293, 293. We had a request for this song from our senior pastor. And uh, I'm not sure I've ever led this song, but I've heard it before. But let thy mantle fall on me. 293. You do whatever you want and we'll figure it out. <laughs>
290.
Thank you for your good singing. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Tim, for leading us in those songs tonight. And uh, I think that there could be a, a strong desire on all of our parts to say, Lord, send that old-time power. Lord, we want to see what happened to Acts. We want to see it happen today. But I want to tell you, it takes, it takes acting as they did in the book of Acts. <laughs> waiting in his presence and waiting for the endowment of power. And I was noticing some of those verses that we sang about <clears throat> that says, Come take possession of thine own. All self-consume, all sin destroy. With earnest zeal endue, each waiting heart to work for thee. Well, there's some, there's some commitment on our part, isn't there? I believe God wants to do his part. But there's something on our part that we must, we must fulfill. And I believe God wants to do that in this day. <clears throat> 2024, I believe God is just the same he's always been. And may God help us to do our part. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Tim, for leading us in the singing tonight. <clears throat> We're going to pray together. And I'm going to ask Brother Albertson if he will lead us in prayer in just a couple of moments. And uh, several requests were made mention this morning that I want to uh, mention again this evening. Some ongoing physical needs that uh, we are praying for here at Burlington. Continue to pray for Sister Albertson and Sister Cooper and uh, Reese Litchfield. Uh, Brother Sankey has been struggling quite a bit with, uh, with pneumonia and uh, just uh, having a difficult time. So grateful he was able to be here this morning. But it was uncertain about this evening. Let's continue to pray for him. Uh, Mike Erie is in rehab and uh, is doing well uh, physically. He's making progress, but I'm happy to report, as Daryl mentioned this morning, he is making progress spiritually. And uh, I am just so very grateful that God, uh, in the midst of a difficult circumstance, God has used that to get his attention and uh, he is ready to get back here <clears throat> in the house of the Lord and uh, has just made some uh, verbal commitments to me. And I'm so very grateful for what God is doing. But let's continue to pray for, uh, for Mike Geary. So good to see Betty Lawson here. I was unable to be here this morning just uh, in the middle of, uh, of wearing a heart monitor as well as some med, meds that need to be changed and so forth. I'm glad she's here tonight. But let's continue to pray for uh, Betty this evening. Brother Sutherland mentioned his uh, granddaughter, Brittany. We want to continue to remember her as we pray, taking treatments for cancer. The Lord is able to give her special help. <clears throat> we want to be praying for all of the camps and youth camps. And uh, Daryl mentioned this morning that they are starting a camp. Uh, started this evening. It goes through next Sunday evening, just a, um, an evening camp. And they will be staying at home and driving back and forth about 45 minutes from here. But we want to be praying, <clears throat> and my guess is some of our people are there at that, uh, that service tonight. But we want to be praying uh, for that service tonight, and, uh, and then be praying for all the camps and youth camps throughout this summer. And uh, I, I, just, I just feel like the Lord wants to use these camps and youth camps uh, to make a, a, an eternal difference in the lives of those that are there. And I, I believe he wants to do that to encourage our hearts and strengthen us. And so let's, let's pray for these camp meetings uh, and youth camps. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for the conflicts around the world, Israel and Russia and Ukraine. Let's continue to remember these. <clears throat> Brother Stetler mentioned this morning uh, the Papua New Guinea Bible Church. Uh, I asked him to, to request prayer for <clears throat> the church over there in Papua New Guinea. Um, just, uh, just a bright spot. Um, in today of what God is able to do and what God is doing just an evangelistic and outreach church um, organization that is just making a huge difference in that country but anytime there's spiritual progress there is the devil fighting and just on a couple of fronts that that I'm aware of that they they are just facing um, a difficult time and I want us to pray that God would work in their midst that God's will would be done and the enemy would be defeated. Don't we, don't we all want that, the enemy to be defeated in all of this? And, uh, and I, I believe that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen? And so we, we have uh, on our side, we have the God who is all-powerful. And, uh, and yet I know that the Lord uh, allows man to make decisions. And so uh, with the free moral agency. And so I want us to pray that, that God would do his work 
there in Papua New Guinea in the Bible Church. So if you would help me remember them in prayer, I would certainly appreciate it. Are there any other spoken requests that you would like to mention this morning or this evening as we pray? Any other needs? Yes, Annalene. Yes. Yes. All right, let's do remember Annalise's grandmother. The Lord knows all about that need. He's able. <clears throat> There's nothing too difficult for our God. And so uh, we want to pray for Annalise's grandmother. The Lord would give a special, special help in this difficult circumstance. Any other requests that you might want to mention tonight? <clears throat> yes, Brother Stan? <clears throat> all right, let's do pray for, for Buster. And uh, Buster was here a couple of weeks ago and, and participated in the, the men's camp out and uh, just was so, uh, so pleased with our church and was just uh, very, very grateful, said such kind words, <clears throat> said, I believe these are the most kind and genuine people I know. And uh, just so very grateful that uh, he was impacted and touched, <clears throat> and so much so, he's, he's going with us to Men Arise, and so I think that's a wonderful thing, and uh, so he signed up, and I'm very grateful, but let's pray for Buster, the Lord would continue to work in his heart, I know God is being faithful, any other requests that you would like to mention tonight, as we pray? <clears throat> All right, let's do remember both of these families family that was missionaries to Haiti. I'm sure you've seen, some of you have seen it on social media. It's made its round. A uh, young family, just in their 20s, missionaries to Haiti, uh, were murdered. And then there was also a Haitian man that was the head of a, an orphanage over there, leaves behind a wife and a couple of kids, maybe more. And uh, we want to pray for these that are affected by that. The Lord would give special help. In a country that is that is just has, has a lot of unrest, a lot of turmoil. And I know that God can use negative circumstances for his glory and honor. So let's pray that that would be the case in this circumstance. Any other requests that you'd like to mention? Yes, Brother Witt. I don't want to get you on the list, but I need three prayer requests. Uh, we just, Michelle just told me this morning, Thursday, that she was going to be Yes, let's do remember these. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Brother Witt, for, for mentioning that. Let's remember these requests, those that are grieving, and that the Lord would give them comfort, and then the Lord would also provide direction. <clears throat> I'm so grateful God has what we need. There's a lot of needs represented here tonight, a lot of needs represented by those that we know and those that are connected to us. But our God is sufficient. Our God is able. And uh, so we, we want to go into prayer tonight with praise in our heart, thanking him that he is enough. He is sufficient. And then let's bring our petitions to the Lord tonight. Let's remember spiritual needs connected to this church and in our community. Even as our church is represented in the parade tomorrow, let's pray that that awareness uh, would, uh, would just stir on people's hearts and uh, make them aware of, of a different way to live. And uh, so let's pray, pray for these needs. Maybe you have unspoken requests you'd like to mention. Many, many needs represented by those, those hands tonight. Let's stand together. Brother Albertson will lead us in prayer, and let's join with him. You may not be able to remember every quest, but the ones the Lord brings to your mind, let's take it to the Lord in prayer this evening as he leads us. Yes, Lord, we do thank you tonight for the opportunity that we have of bowing in your presence tonight. God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So grateful, Lord, that you are sufficient. Thank you, Lord, that you are enough. Thank you, Lord, that you're all that we need. <clears throat> we give you praise and glory and honor tonight. Thank you, Lord, that the 
request tonight isn't something that, that is too heavy for you to bear, but you told us to come boldly. You told us to roll our cares, our burdens over on you. You said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. We thank you, Lord, for a God of invitation. Oh, we give you praise tonight. Oh, we we're thankful, Lord, that you don't stand with arms outstretched in a way that says, no, that's too much or that's too difficult or, or that's too many. But, Lord, you stand with arms open inviting us to come, inviting us to bring our needs, inviting us to, to ask for your grace and strength and help. So, Lord, we're asking you to help us tonight. We need you, Lord. We need you. Every hour we need you. Oh, blessed Jesus, would you come? Would you do what only you can do, I pray? Oh, blessed Lord, would you come and, and give special help to spiritual needs that are represented, the physical needs, Lord, and financial needs, and all the needs that are represented here tonight, these that are grieving, oh God, we pray that you would wrap your arms around them and give them the comfort and strength that they need in this difficult hour. We pray, oh God, that you would do it. <clears throat> We're trusting you. We're trusting you tonight. Oh God, accomplish your plan and purposes, we pray. We're trusting you. We're trusting you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, God, would you give us help, we pray. We're trusting you in the furtherance of this service. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Brother Albertson, for leading us in prayer this evening. We're going to do something uh, additional in this service tonight than what we typically do. But uh, we have a couple of uh, family or uh, entities, institutions that uh, we are wanting to have special prayer for. And uh, so we are going to pray for the Witt family. The Witt family is going to Montana uh, for the summer and ministering at Northwest Indian Bible School. And uh, so they were going, they're going to be engaged in really acts of service and, and helping out on the campus there. They're just availing themselves uh, for the two and a half months or whatever that they are there. And, uh, and so we want to have special prayer for them. And then we are, we are going to have special prayer for uh, Chandler and Melissa Witter. They are, uh, as you've probably seen, taking a church in Texas and will be moving mid-July. Uh, but this is their last Sunday here. And uh, so they have a little family vacation and then they have an internship and then they move to Texas. So this is their last service here. And it's been such a joy to have uh, Chandler and Melissa as a part of our, our congregation in the last several years for Chandler uh, as he attended here while he was at God's Bible School. And then Melissa came back to work at uh, GBS and somehow they got together and uh, were married and have attended here for the last little while. And it's been a joy to have them a part of our congregation. So I'm going to ask if the wits would come and uh, if you could be... You know, take this side of the altar, and if the widders would come, and I'm going to ask them to kneel right here, and and then I'm going to ask our board if they would at least come, and anybody else that's interested to gather around these, and uh, especially our board at least. But I, I want others to join. If you have interest, go ahead and have uh, and kneel there at the altar, and uh, I have asked uh, Brother Lonnie Witt to pray a special prayer uh, over his son and their family. And then uh, President Loper is going to pray prayer uh, over the widders. But uh, those of you that are interested, if you don't mind, to gather around these and uh, let's just have a good season of prayer. And I, I am just so grateful for a ministry-minded church that are, that are willing to take the pastorate and, and willing to go on missions trips. And I know that our own church here has has uh, had several young people. It's kind of the dynamics of being close to a Bible college, but several young people that have been here that have then gone out into the ministry. And really, to be honest, we don't want them to stay here. 
We don't want them to stay here. God has a place for them in his kingdom to advance it in only the ways that God has for them to do it. And so it's a privilege for our Burlington Church family to surround them with our love and prayer. And so I am going to ask uh, Brother Loper if he will pray for the Witters. And I want us to join them. And, uh, and then we'll have Brother Witt pray for the, uh, for the Wits. So let's pray together. I'm so grateful that Jesus, before he ascended back to the Father, left us with an incredible promise that's connected to the Great Commission when he said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in anything that we, that we do as we go out and try to advance his kingdom, we don't do it alone. We go in his presence and his power. So I'm very grateful for that. So our prayers with you as you go. And may God, God give you fruit for your labors and advance his kingdom because of your, your endeavors. All right. Well, before the ushers come, as they are preparing to come, let me mention just a few announcements. Don't forget tomorrow is the parade. And I, I hope I don't have to give all the, the details again. But uh, if you have any questions about the parade, let us know about times and all of that kind of thing. Uh, the parade does begin 10 o'clock. Is that right? 10 o'clock. So if you're just wanting to, to go and watch, that's when it begins. But if you're planning to participate, um, talk to us after the service. We can give you all the instructions that you need. Then don't forget, Thursday evening is a youth banquet. That's at 730. And you young people keep that in mind. 
And, uh, and then there are several other announcements on the e-bulletin. I kind of skipped over a couple of them this morning because of time constraints. But uh, we are doing camp meeting time again this, this July, every Sunday night in July. We're going to have a camp meeting time emphasis. And so we have several speakers already lined up. And I think you're going to enjoy that, that time together. So keep that in mind. And then later in July, July 31st to August 4th is Vacation Bible School. Uh, so you want to keep those things uh, on your calendar. And if you want to know what's happening the rest of the year, if you go on the e-bulletin at the top of that is, a, is a, an annual calendar. You can check that out. Make sure you have all the church things in your calendar. All right, the ushers are coming. This time, wait on you for the evening offering. The Lord bless you as you worship in your giving tonight. <clears throat> Thank you for that beautiful music this evening. We have a special number in song. The Loper family is coming to minister in song. The Lord bless them as they come and share. And uh, let's allow God to speak to us through their ministry of song tonight. Like a poor red 
wretched beggar. for that wonderful song. Do you remember the bondage? <clears throat> but then do you remember the emancipation, the liberty? Praise the Lord. Thank you for that wonderful reminder in song this evening. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a couple different passages this evening. We're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, and then we'll be in Luke's gospel chapter 18. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 5. And then we will be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. We are celebrating Pentecost Sunday today uh, because we weren't able to do it last week. And so we had a special speaker here this morning. I certainly appreciated Brother Terry Going's message and ministry among us. And uh, such a, a wonderful, gracious man. And uh, so, so wonderful to to hear him and his message on holiness. I certainly appreciate that. So we are continuing on the theme of holiness tonight. Recently, I was told about someone who had encouraged a local congregation to quit using the word holiness and instead use the word Christ-like, evidently because society doesn't understand what holiness means. Well, I, I certainly don't have a problem with the term Christ-like, obviously, and I think Christ-like and holiness are, are very, very closely, closely aligned together. Christ-like, the term, is clearly a biblical concept and a biblical mandate for us. But I do have a problem with the removal of holiness from our religious vocabulary. <clears throat> well, I didn't get too many amens, but I believe it. I know we must reach our spiritually illiterate culture. I understand that. I know that we need to be relevant. I know they don't understand all of our lingo. I get it. But we as a Christian community don't need to remove terms of our doctrine in an effort to be more understood. I think we need to use the term and we need to teach the term so that they are familiar with it. Amen? I think that's the truth. Holiness is God's essence. Holiness is God's character. Holiness is man's requirement for heaven. Holiness is the road I'm traveling. Holiness is a destination. Holiness is a journey. A couple stops along the way. We still believe in two definite works of grace, don't we? couple stop, stops along the way, but I want you to know it's more than just two trips to the altar. Holiness is a journey that takes us from when we begin to all the way to get to heaven. We must not lose this doctrine. God is a holy God, requires us to be a holy people, and the way to become a holy person is through the work of holiness in the human heart. I want to begin with this question tonight. How many times have you refused to do something you knew you should? And it's a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask for anybody to actually say anything. 
How many times have you refused to do something you knew that you should? I know that we've just come through college. At least some of you students are, are done with college. But how many of you knew as soon as you got your class assignments at the beginning of the semester that you should start reading your collateral, right? But for whatever reason, you didn't. And you had 2,000 pages to read in the last five minutes of class, right? Just cramming it in, right? <laughs> I guess there are many scenarios that we could consider. But in these and other scenarios, we knew we should have done this or that, but we refused. And as a result of refusing to do what we knew we should do, we suffered the consequences, right? There are always consequences connected to that. With that thought in mind, I want to consider the prevention of holiness. Or maybe, maybe we, could, we could call it roadblocks of holiness in our life. Let me state this in a question. What is it that keeps individuals from pursuing holiness? What is it that keeps individuals from being holy? You know it is God's character. You know it is God's command for us, right? 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1 verse 15 talks about, Be ye holy for I am holy. It's God's character. It's God's call. It's God's command for us. But what is it that keeps individuals from becoming holy? So many individuals know it's God's will for them to become holy, but they, they constantly refuse to allow God to make them holy. So in this very simple message, let me offer two suggestions found with, within two different stories from Scripture that I believe helps to answer the question... Why many people refuse the work of holiness in their heart. First, we're going to look at the Old Testament book of 2 Kings in chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha sees Elijah transported to heaven. Elisha takes the mantle that has fallen to the ground and picks it up and he smites the waters and he says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? You remember that? And the God that had been with Elijah was now with Elisha. And so in the next chapters, we begin reading about this man named Elisha. As you continue reading, Elisha is the man of God who, who does many miraculous things. And in chapter 5, we're given one of the, the more familiar stories from the life of Elisha that has a very important lesson for us. Chapter 5, verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. We quickly get the picture that this was a great man. He was a, he was a great general. He was held in high esteem by his master. <clears throat> but you keep reading the verse, and the last phrase of the verse tells us, but he was a leper. Naaman's day, as you, as you know, this diagnosis was hopeless. It was without a cure. It was, it was a death sentence. Verse 2, we keep reading, the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Here we have an Israelite girl serving in a foreign land. And she said unto her mistress, in verse 3, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. This little girl, this Israelite maid, becomes aware of Naaman's condition. And she offers a beacon of hope to the hopeless. Can you imagine being in Naaman's position? Knowing there is a death sentence over your head. And all of a sudden, this little girl, this, this Jewish maid, says, I think I have an answer. <laughs> what a beautiful illustration of us today where God makes us beacons of hope to those who are without hope. May God make it so in our lives. 
So the Israelite girl tells her mistress, who tells her husband, who goes to the king. Verse number four, we keep reading. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, ten changes of raiment, <coughs> a large sum of uncertain value. He brings the letter to the king of Israel. Verse 6 says, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. In the study, I learned that it was the practice of Eastern culture that the main object was only stated in the letter that was to be carried out by the party concerned, and, and the other details would be worked out in the interview. And so very bluntly and pointedly, the letter is asking the king to heal Naaman. Verse 7, And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? To kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. The king perhaps is thinking this was an effort to begin a war. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me. And he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. Oh, what faith. Faith exhibited in that verse. Send him to me and he shall know. So Naaman came with his horses, with his chariot, stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. He doesn't even come out to talk to this important man. He says, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Very easy very simple instructions. Your leprosy will be cured. Just go and wash seven times. Notice Naaman's response. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper." He says, Are not our Abana and, and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman <clears throat> was allowing something so trivial to keep him from a complete healing. It just wasn't happening the way he thought. And his servants came near, spake unto him, and said, My father, we're getting right down to the crux of the matter. The servants said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. <clears throat> we're getting to the heart of the matter, aren't we? The servants knew their master. They knew that if the prophet had asked him to do something great, if they had asked him to do something noble, something spectacular, Naaman would have done it. But if it involved humbling himself, he wasn't interested. He's about ready to go all the way back to Damascus with the death sentence still over his head with leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar better rivers I could go wash in? Why do I have to go wash in muddy Jordan? He's about to go back the same way he came. But thankfully, Naaman listened to the reasons of his servants. And instead of being bullheaded, he humbled himself he consented, and notice verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He had gotten a clear record from his doctors. 
Everything was clear. And nestled within this little account in Old Testament, I find the first prevention of holiness in our lives, and that is selfish pride. Selfish pride. I want you to hear me on this tonight. There are some people who will never get the spiritual help that they need in their life because they're too proud to admit they have a need. If you can't admit your need for spiritual help because of what your family will think of you, if you're not willing to admit your spiritual need because you'll be embarrassed of what those who go to church with you may think, You'll not do what you know you should. And the work of holiness will be prevented in your heart. I wonder this evening if there's someone here who has not been allowing God to work in their heart because they're too proud to admit they have a need. Can I tell you, friend, if that's you, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to sit back in your seat with a, with a stubbornness and worried what people's going to think about you, about getting things right with God, it's not worth it. Did you hear me? It's not worth it. Bring your need to Jesus. Admit your need. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He can do the work that needs done in your heart. John Stott once said, pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. <clears throat> Pride's your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. Don't allow selfish pride to keep you from the work that God wants to do in your heart. The next step that God is leading you on, don't allow pride what will my friends think? What if, I, what if I step out? They think I'm a Christian. They think I'm doing everything I know I'm supposed to be doing. If I step out, what are they going to think about me? And the enemy will get you at every time on those thoughts to keep you from making spiritual progress. But friend, I want you to know that you step out and you mind God and your friends are going to have a greater estimation of you. Because you're humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. And he will exalt you. James 4 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Not only is selfish pride a prevention of holiness. There's another I want to mention. And we're going to look now in New Testament to Luke's Gospel chapter 18. It's another familiar account. Luke chapter 18 and verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The young ruler comes with a great desire. He, in fact, one of the, one of the passages says he comes running. There, there's this intense desire. He comes with a, a great question. Jesus says unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. He says, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And in verse 21, he says, All these have I kept from my youth up. And then in 22, verse 22, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. You see, Jesus knew the issue that was preventing this man from spiritual victory and spiritual progress. This is not the issue for every person. You understand. Jesus knew this man. And in fact, in verse 23, it tells us he was very rich. Jesus knew this man. He knew what his hang-up was. And so Jesus very clearly lays out the prescription for this man, knowing who he is, knowing what he needed. He says, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. God had a very clear prescription for him. 
And when he heard it, verse 23 says, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He came seeking, he came pursuing, he came asking, and he left very sorrowful. You say, Pastor Andy, what is the second prevention of holiness in our hearts? Very simply, it's selfish pursuits. When it came right down to why the rich young ruler didn't do what Jesus said and thus refused to allow Jesus to work in his heart, he wanted to do his own thing instead of doing what Jesus wanted him to do. It's the bottom line, isn't it? <clears throat> he just had other plans for himself. There was something on the inside of him. There was a desire on the inside of him. He had a great question. He was a good moral man. He recognized that something was lacking, right? He said, Lord, what am I lacking? Jesus clearly gives him the instructions. He has heard Jesus face to face. He knew what Jesus was asking. And he came to the crossroads of a decision in that moment. And he said, I want to do what I want to do instead of what God wants me to do. I'm convinced that this is the single biggest prevention of holiness in the human heart. <clears throat> because as we walk this road of life, as we walk this journey of holiness that God is leading us on, there are many times along the way when God speaks to our heart about a given issue. Right? You've perhaps faced it. You know what I'm talking about. You're walking in harmony. You're walking in fellowship with God. You have a clear experience. And then all of a sudden, God speaks to you about a given issue. And at that moment, we come to the crossroads, don't we? And many at this crossroads weigh out the options. Which am I going to do? I know what God has said. I know what he's expecting. I read his word. He's asking me to apply this in this way. I know what he's saying but I'm not willing to do it. So many at this crossroads choose to go their own way and do their own thing. <clears throat> In the following quote, Thomas Merton identifies the key reason why many fail to experience the freedom of joy Christ offers. And I would add, fail to experience holiness. And this is what he says. It's not that someone else is preventing you from living happily, or I would add holy. It's not that someone else is preventing you from living happily. He says, you yourself do not know what you want. He says, rather than admit this and ask for God's help, you pretend that someone else is keeping you from exercising your liberty. Who is this, he says. And he says, it is yourself. What's he saying? Self is the great preventer of spiritual life. You can be your own worst enemy when it comes to your walk with God. There's not a person in this room or in this world that can make you allow God to work in your heart if you don't want him to. You can resist holiness. You can refuse to allow God to work in your heart by choosing like the rich young ruler did to want your own way more than God. Selfish. Pursuits. You say, Pastor Andy, what are those selfish pursuits? What are those things that will prevent holiness in my heart? Guess what? I don't have a list. I don't have a list in front of me. 
But I have the answer. Anything that God lays his finger on in your life. Anything that God puts his finger on in your life and you refuse to deal with it because you want what you want more than what you than more than you want to please God. Can I tell you that thing he's put his finger on is a selfish pursuit that will zap your spiritual life and will bring spiritual destruction. So I'm not here to tell you what that is. I don't have a list, as I mentioned. But I do know this, that in our walk with God, in this holiness journey, God knows you. God knows your need. God knows the things that might cause you to stumble. God knows those things that are strong temptations to you. And so what he does is he, he, he incorporates these guardrails into our life in an effort to keep you from falling. And so what he does is he touches you on this issue and this issue and this issue, and it'll be different for you than it is for me, be different for so-and-so than it is for you, but it's God's finger. And every time he puts his finger on something, you come to the crossroads. We all do. We can try to put it on the back burner. We can try to kick the can down the road and say, I'll deal with it later. But listen, he's putting his finger on it. <clears throat> And you come to the crossroads of a decision. And when we choose to say, I want to do my own thing, the work of holiness stops in our heart. Oh, thank God he's a faithful God. Thank God he's a God of mercy. And I'm not talking about just doing things randomly and doing things rash, uh, in a rash way because he's a God that allows us to try the spirits. What I'm talking about is when after we've tried the spirits and it's very clear what God is asking of us, when we say, I want to do my own thing instead of what God wants me to do, friend, I want you to know that you have stopped the work of holiness in your heart. I want to tell every one of you young people, at this crossroads over and over and over again, you'll have to make the decision to say, I will do what God wants me to do, or your life will end in destruction. But it's not just young people, because all of us on this journey are going to have God speak to us. And oh, may it be in our hearts that we say, Lord, I've already established the answer. I have already established the answer. Whatever you say, Lord, is yes from my heart. I want you to continue to work your holiness in my life. So in closing, I ask you this question. Is there anyone who has lately prevented the work of God in your heart? Have you been aware of his spirit speaking to your heart about a specific need in your life? Maybe an attitude, maybe a habit, maybe an activity. Perhaps God has dealt with you about your needs, some area in which you need God to work in your heart, but you refuse to humble yourself. You've refused to admit your need. Maybe too proud to seek forgiveness, too proud to seek cleansing. Maybe it's a specific area of need in your heart. You've allowed these selfish pursuits. Can I challenge you with this reminder? Allowing God to do what he wants to do in your life is always the best option. There are all of these countless people here in this sanctuary tonight who have made it their practice to say, yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. And their lives are marked by beauty, marked by holiness, marked by progress, marked by spiritual maturity, marked by God's work in their life because they've said yes to God and to his way. Don't allow, don't allow the enemy to talk you into trading spiritual life or the work of holiness at work in your heart for any selfish pursuit or selfish pride. Heaven will be worth it all. And living with his approval is worth everything you have 
to give up for him down here. Allow God complete and unhindered right away in your life and allow holiness to continue to work in your life. Let's stand together. Let's close by singing this chorus together. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. Oh, here's the key. With my whole heart, I'll agree. And